The following interview was conducted with James A. Bemiller, Professor Emeritus of Food Science for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, June 6, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Professor Thank Bemiller. You. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Let's start Appreciate off. Tell us a little about where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was born in Evansville, Indiana on April 7th, 1933, okay. which my father liked to tell people I was born on the day beer came back because it was the day <laughs> Prohibition ended. That's a good claim to fame. You ought to yeah. get a, you know, a Budweiser ought to send you the Clydesdales well, to visit. Well, there's another interesting story connected to that, sure. which I, I wasn't going good. to tell you. But yeah. anyway, um, I made the front page of the paper because the doctor was rushing to the hospital to deliver me early in the morning and an intersection a few blocks away from the hospital he hit a truckload of pigs and turned the truck over and the pigs were running around and the police had to come and and <laughs> catch the pigs and he walked the rest of the way to the hospital <laughs> and it was all my fault <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot right okay. yeah yeah so that was uh, my being born in that day my um, I was born to, my parents were Lamar N. B. Miller and Mabel Gruber B. Miller, uh, both of whom attended Purdue. Um, my, my father um, grew up on a farm like most of the people in his era. Sure. And, but then he was, of course, the first one in his family to ever go to college. And he came to Purdue and graduated in 1926 <clears throat> with a degree in agricultural chemistry um, and uh, went to work for me Johnson and Company in which is Evansville. down in Evansville uh -huh. yeah. okay. Evansville that's the reason I was born there um, in nutritional aspects and he was involved in developing pablum the first baby cereal and and extra maltose infant formulas and and another later things like sustacal and metrical and so forth sure <clears throat> and I, I have three brothers, and my brothers and I were guinea pigs from those development processes. I think we tried out all that stuff. You got samples, so right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my mother never graduated from Purdue. She is that where they married. met? They left, meet yeah, with? So they left. With, they met while they were students here, and um, and uh, he married my father, and they moved mm -hmm. to Evansville, where we were born. And you were right. Did you go to grade school and high school there? I went uh, went to grade school in in well in Evansville. Um, this could get to be kind of a long story, but it's in okay. the, in the in about 1937 or 38 or so, uh, something like that. My father bought 63 acres of of scrub land, and it wasn't farmable land, not half forested, wooded in those days. Uh, in the northern end of Vanderburgh County, about 20-something miles north of Evansville, with the idea of building on there. And he had the uh, CCC come in, uh, so the Civilian Conservation Corps, and build a five-acre lake, and they, and they cut, uh, had them clear out the, the woods, the old timber, big oak trees, and took them to the sawmill and had it sawed into lumber that he was going to build a house from. Um, and was aging the wood, and just then in 1941, when World War II broke out, they couldn't do that. Um, so um, then we, we were still in Evansville. In 19, I think it was about 44, we moved to an uh, area north of Evansville called McCutcheonville, and I went to the seventh and eighth grade there. Um, a three-room schoolhouse, we had three, eight, one first, second grade were in one room, third, fourth, and fifth in the other, and oh my. sixth, what seventh, an and eighth in another, three teachers. And so that's, um, uh, but after the elementary school, all <clears> of the <throat> county students went to high school in Evansville, at Wrights High School in the west side of Evansville. So um, that's, that's where I went to high okay. school, and then long bus ride, but. <laughs> to high school there. What was any uh, organizations? What was high school like? Was it a, any special programs that you took there, or at, in, while in high school? No, I was okay. just in a, in a college prep uh, okay. course in high school. 
Okay. Yeah. Was it a lot, school pretty good size? School was a good size school, right. yeah. Because it was probably it was, the only one in that area there, pretty much? It was, yeah. well, it, uh, Wright's High School uh, covered uh, the west end of Evansville and all of the county students. Wow. Anybody that lived outside of the city limits of Evansville okay. went to that school. And, okay. and they had the, you know, they had the um, vocational ag programs sure. and things like that. Right. Because it was, it was probably, I, I'm not even sure, probably about two-thirds county students in the third yeah. in the west side of Evansville. Okay, good. And then how did you decide to come to Purdue? Oh, that's another long story. Um, I decided what I wanted to Of course your to father was an alum. The father was an alum and and um, but I decided what I wanted to do in life when I was I don't know, ten or eleven years old. Exactly what I'm doing now. Um, and that was uh, because I had read some some book somewhere, and I, I can I can date this because I know it was before we moved to McCutcheon, before I was in the seventh grade. Okay. And you know I was interested in science, and I had chemistry sets and things like that the okay. kids had, and I got a hold of a couple books I don't know I read about George Washington Carver and how he made things useful things out of the peanut, I know the agricultural sure. materials, and I said, that's what I want to do. Okay. So I had that goal in mind. And when I graduated from high school, that was the, that was, uh, well, first of all, Purdue was a logical place to go. It was the, uh, uh, the, the state school, the land grant right. school, and they had the kind of curriculum I wanted. Sure. <clears throat> so I came, and came to Purdue. Um, and in the same major my father had, agricultural chemistry. Um, and it was, um, as you know, I was, was also a graduate student at, at Purdue. And that came about in this way. When, when I was a, a freshman, and I think in my sophomore year, at least in my freshman year, I know I had, had a, a student job, a student work. I was working in the horticultural greenhouses and the, uh, but I was a major in, in what was then ag chemistry, and, and the head of the department, Professor Quackenbush, um, had found out that I was, had this job there, and so he called me into his office and said he'd give me a job working in the department. In ag chemistry? In ag chemistry, okay. right, it was then. And so, um, said so that'd be great, so I did that. So I spent the rest of my undergraduate years uh, cleaning rat cages and um, working in the seed lab, cleaning out old seed and things like that, sure. some, some dirty work. But uh, the building deputy was Professor Whistler, and uh, he, had a, he had a graduate student under him that, that did a lot of the work, uh, Lou Smart. And, Lou Smart and Whistler had written the first book on polysaccharide chemistry at that time together. Anyway, I was I was um, was working with um, Aslan as a, as a as undergraduate student, and I had intention all along of going to graduate school. So I applied to several graduate schools and and was accepted and. Uh, the one I chose was the University of Wisconsin. And I got a letter from them, they said, you're accepted, but we need, for the official records, we need a letter on file saying that, uh, you know, a letter of recommendation. So I went to Professor Whistler and asked him for a letter of recommendation. And he looked at me and said, you're not going to Wisconsin, you're staying here. And I said, oh, I am? And he said, so he asked me what I was wanted to do, what my goals were, and I told him, and he said, this is the best lab in the country for doing that. And he was right. And so I stayed and I got my, I got a master's degree in Department of Agricultural Biochemistry and a PhD in Department of Biochemistry. And I, I didn't move anywhere. The department kept changing its name sure. <laughs> in between well, my degrees. Well, agricultural, now biochemistry was formerly agricultural chemistry. Is that correct? Right. Yes, that's okay. that's right. Yeah. It was formerly. All right. Were mm -hmm. were your classes mostly in the, what's now the biochem building? Is that where you had? Was that? 
You know. Because um, the lily didn't exist at that thinking time. Thinking on back. Oh. No, lily uh, was under construction. Okay. It didn't exist. It was in the what is now the biochemistry building. Um, I think. This was, uh, I graduated in 1954, an mm -hmm. undergraduate. Right. Um, I think there were two of us that were majors in there. Um, there wasn't much of a curriculum in there, so we had a lot of electives. Okay. And, and I, the reason, well, let me go back and say, the reason I think there were two of us, so we really didn't have classes together necessarily, so I'm really not sure that there wasn't a, there wasn't a group, yeah. So, and I took um, uh, the electives, I, I took a lot of electives in chemistry, and, and I substituted um, ag courses for, uh, or uh, courses in the School of Science for the ag courses, like there was an agricultural botany, I took the, the botany with the science and so forth. So I was out of the department a lot. Sure. And I ended up with, I had more credits in chemistry than the chem majors had because they had a more set curriculum and I could and you did. could, yeah, could electively do mm -hmm. my electives. So um, the, the answer is no, there wasn't, there wasn't, there was a few classes. I had some classes in sure. uh, biochemistry in, in the building, what is now the biochemistry right. building, but not a lot. Yeah. Uh, where'd you live on campus? Did you live in a dorm or did you in a, I, I know there weren't a lot of apartments, I know there were houses and things probably. Most of my um, uh, activities as an undergraduate were in fraternity. I was a fraternity when I was a freshman. Um, I had a young man calling me by the name of Birch Bay, and Birch Bay was later Senator Bay. Um, asked me to uh, to come over and talk about pledging the Alpha Tau Omega fraternity and um, and see that. So I did and. Um, Battled Birch, uh, worked my way up through all the offices in the fraternity, became president myself. He was president was of the fraternity Was he in your class? Then. Was he in the same class or was he ahead of you? He was ahead of me. He okay. was, uh, well, just, he, he was a senior when I was a freshman, oh, okay. I think, or so he was a couple maybe years a junior. Ahead. He was a, two, three years ahead of me. But he was, um, uh, add to this and say, when I, when I arrived on campus, I was one of the greenest freshmen that ever arrived on campus. I had just turned 17 that, the April before I arrived on campus, <laughs> young kid, and what I found was lots of returning veterans, older people that had yeah. all these older Still experiences. Still coming from that time, yeah. But it was, it was declining because I happen to know, since I ended up being president of my graduating class, I would, um, the, um, I know it was the smallest graduating class since World War II. It, it, this it, is it was a big bulge after World War II and then it dipped down and then the university started going up again. Sure. 54 was the smallest. Uh -huh. But uh, so I had, uh, had a fraternity house full of a couple of freshmen my age but a lot of older people. Sure. And Birch was a, was a veteran. He had, he had served in, uh, I know he was in Germany. In, in the then Army. he had come back after? I think, I think he was not in fighting, but he was in there after the fighting ended in 45, 46. Yeah. So, but um, uh, Birch was, in, was in, in the School of Agriculture, too, and he Very nice. knew about me and That's good. came over, yeah. Good, way to get started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then after you finished, do you, do you, is that when you left Purdue, or tell us after you finished? I, well, that's another interesting okay. story. I had, um, uh, in, uh, when I finished my PhD and I was looking to go somewhere, the department Did you plan had, to go into teaching or were you going to go into research? I was going to go into teaching. Okay. Uh, I was wanted to be an academic position. Uh -huh. And again, the department head, Dr. Quackenbush, came and asked me if I would stay and teach a course. He had a faculty member just left and he wanted me to teach a course. The course was plant biochemistry. And it turned out that was the only graduate course in the department that I'd never taken. I was, I was scheduled to take it in the spring of 1957, and in that January, I slipped on the ice on campus and broke my back and ended up in the hospital for nine weeks. And then I was in a body cast for some time after that, and was so I, 
I missed that whole spring semester when I was to take that course. And I told him, I said, you know, that's the one course I've never taken. <laughs> and I know if I can do it. Well, it was, it's, it's kind of a surprise I went into teaching after that because it was a trial by fire, it really was. I, I, it was a graduate course. I had um, people from plant physiology and so forth, graduate students that knew more about the subject than I did. <laughs> It was, uh, it was, uh, um, you know, I was thrown into this and trying to keep ahead of them, and um, it was, but it was fun. It was a good experience Did you for have me. Any, were there any TAs to help you? Did they have TAs at that time? Did you have a TA or something? No, like this was just a, this was, was it just a, large, a lecture course. Or, no, was it a large course. class or not too much? Oh, I, you know, I don't remember, okay. but I, 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 probably not. my mind is uh, probably about a dozen students. Sure. Oh, that's not too bad. That's a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, right. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. then go on. What came next then? Did you say after the, after, uh, then I was, I did that for two years in, in what would, today they'd call it a teaching postdoc because sure. I was still doing research in, in uh, Whistler's lab and, and uh, in what I love to do in polysaccharide. Um, and then uh, after two years, I decided it was I really needed to get away from, from that. So I looked around and, and interviewed at a number of places and chose uh, Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. And that was a it was a small department. It had a great reputation as being a really a good chemistry department. In mm -hmm. fact, we had I had a couple of fellow graduate students who were very top notch who had come from that program. And so we went there. It was an exciting time. The university was transitioning from a teacher's college to a full-fledged university. I started there in 1961 in the Department of Chemistry as the biochemist. They hired me as the biochemist. They teach biochemistry. Well, the uh, university was probably about 8,000 students then. But it was growing somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 students a year. And by, by the first decade after tenure, by 1971 or so, they, they capped the enrollment at 22,000 students. Uh, it had grown that much. And it was transitioning from a teacher's college to a, uh, what Illinois calls a comprehensive university with PhDs, across the board in all disciplines and sure. schools of law, medicine, and dentistry. Oh, including the professional schools. Professional mm -hmm. schools too. And in fact, that's a, I was, uh, you can come back to that, I was the first, first uh, basic science appointee in the school of medicine there. But it was, it offered a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities and developing new things and growing. Uh, just in one aspect, I won't dwell on that. I would say I was hired as the biochemist. We added a couple others by 19, late 1960, 68 or so. You know, probably more, there were more biochemists than others in the department and changed the name to the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, oh, okay. department head. And then we, they said, then later on, they formed the Department of Medical Biochemistry that and so there was just a lot of opportunities for leadership and growing and it was just right. it was great fun. Let me ask you this for the research of medical how did they happen to tack that on to it just the medical and biochemistry is that the well that was in the the medical biochemistry was in the new medical school okay okay I say it was I think it was 1971 when they uh -huh. were forming the school oh the school. and they came and and uh, I say I had the first appointment in, in, as a basic science person in the medical school. It was set up so the basic sciences were located in Carbondale. We were in the clinical years, we were in Springfield, Illinois. Okay. So they went the first uh, continuous 12 months in, in, in Carbondale and hired more biochemists in a department, and formed a department of medical biochemistry, but, and I headed that, but I insisted on keeping my appointment in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry because 
that's where I could do the kind of research I wanted to right. do. Much more relevant to your needs. Yeah. yeah. Well, there, I guess there's another kind of a part of the story I could tell on that too, and that is when I, when I started my, my program there and, and I was doing what I wanted to do, I say, what I was trained to do, background, and, um, you know, let me say, when you look at carbohydrates, and I was interested in, uh, well, I say industrial utilization of agricultural materials, but when you look at the agricultural materials, you soon realize that over 90% of all the biomass is carbohydrate in nature, and probably at least close to 90% of that is all in the, the polymeric carbohydrates, carbohydrate polymers called polysaccharides, my mm -hmm. large thing. And, and so that's what I studied. I mean, that's what I was interested in, utilizing those, sure. that great amount of biomass that was out there from whatever source. And, um, but soon after I, in the 60s, a few years after I'd started my own program, uh, the Green Revolution came along and all of a sudden people thought you shouldn't be using anything in agriculture for or other than food to feed the world. And so all of the funding for those kind of programs kind of dried up. That plus the fact that, um, that, uh, that the department had hired me down there to do biochemistry and I thought, and there were students that wanted to do that. So I actually, biochemistry, and research for, for a number of years mm -hmm. and got into medical biochemistry, but I was still doing the more sure. chemical aspects of biochemistry rather than the biological aspects. So I did that for a number of years uh, there in a kind of a little different program. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Uh, um, you want to then you moved on to come back, huh? I come back. Yeah. Well, let start in. Now, I have to tell you this story as it was told to me, okay. <laughs> because I wasn't here <laughs> at the time, but as I understand it. Did you make any visits? Because did you keep in touch with, doc, excuse me, with Dr. Whistler over the time? Yes, we, okay. we worked together. Because uh, you did a lot of work together. We did, we did a lot of writing together. I loved sure. to write, yeah. and we edited yeah, I saw and your list. authored and edited a number of books together. Sure. Um, and um, we would... I came to campus a few times to work on projects. We would see each other at national meetings several sure. times a year and so forth. So it, it kept in contact. But now as I was told the story, uh, uh, the Department of the, the College of Agriculture, School of Agriculture in those days, was formed the, this, the Department of Food Science. And it started in, in 1984, I think in the fall of 84. And Philip Nelson, who was uh, was head of the department then, it was, it was said that, as he told me, he brought industrial people together and asked them, what can we do to put ourselves on the map? Kind of right away. What, what, is, what, what need can we fill to put ourselves on the map? And he was told carbohydrates. And he said, but we don't have a carbohydrate chemist around. Uh, uh, professor Whistler had become an emeritus professor in 1977, I think. Yeah, okay. So about, uh, not quite 10 years earlier. And uh, so, and then where can we find one? He talked to him, and of course Whistler recommended me, and I, I had been doing other things, and, and hardly knew how to spell food, and you know, it was such a thing as food science. But uh, I came in the fall of 85, they had me for an interview, I came and took a look at, uh, at what it was. And it was an opportunity to do what I always wanted to do. I think my, um, well, go back again, all of those carbohydrates, polymers of carbohydrates right. in the world, the polysaccharides, uh, the big uses of them are in things like petroleum production and paper making, and so the food uses are kind of small. Um, so my request uh, 
Dr. Nelson was, you know, I would be interested in starting this carbohydrate research center that that he uh, that they wanted to have, if it was not limited to food uses, if he could use utilization of carbohydrates in any industry. He said that was fine, and uh, so I came and I said it was an opportunity. Well, it turns out that the the money and the interest and the challenges are in the food thing, so I've always worked on food. We really didn't work on other yeah. Yeah, things. And I think he thought that um, the Carbohydrate Research Center, which we named the Whistler Center for Carbohydrate Research, would be myself and some students, or maybe another faculty member. And we, um, we set out with a, with a mission and a vision for the center and um, and it was it was formed in a time of downsizing at least in the School of Agriculture and they were reducing faculty instead of gaining faculty and so I was told great you've got a approval of a center research but there's no money you have to do it so right away we decided Get we're going, going to get do industrial support and I had gone to Washington and talked with the NSF people about university industry um, consortiums that they support. And came back and told Dr. Nelson that I, for a couple of reasons I thought we would be better not doing going into the NSF program but doing it uh, on our own. And, and he agreed with that assessment and uh, we started out and right away we got, it was a period of uh, uh, difficult times for industry too. They were downsizing, they were cutting back. And when you cut back in industry, the first thing you cut is research and when, and when the research director has to cut back, the first thing he cuts is fundamental research, the basic research and, and that's what we were, Wanting. saw ourselves as doing. And so we got support from companies, and by oh, my first five years it started the center. I think we we must have had seven or so faculty and about fifty people in the center. But uh, more than that today. But uh, uh, I was uh, I was wondering whether Dr. Nelson would was going to throw me out and because when the faculty I brought in, let's see, the first, the first person was a, was a physicist, x-ray crystallographer, and who had worked on proteins and they challenged him to work on, on, on carbohydrate, on polysaccharides, because like any polymers, it's the, it's the, uh, in the shape of the molecule that gives it its, its physical properties, which determines its functionality, which determines its uses. And so we needed to know the, how these things, the shapes of them. So, uh, so I brought in that. The second faculty member was an electrical engineer with an, uh, was an expert in image analysis who worked together with the X-ray crystallographer developing the three-dimensional struct images. And then we had two chemical engineers, a rheologist and an interfacial scientist. And, and finally we had a, actually a food scientist uh, uh, Bruce Amaker, who is the current director of the center, doing a, is a great director, uh -huh. and uh, his background was in serial science. And he was he's a Purdue grad and had left here with a PhD and gone to the University of Arkansas. And we brought him back. And oh, good. Okay. Head up the serials lab, and uh, yeah, so we got an electric eclectic group of faculty. I we got say a, so. Right. Got a corn geneticist in the agronomy department. Well, the the two chemical engineers, Dr. Narsimhan and Campanella, are in agricultural and biological engineering, so not all of the faculty of the Whistler sure. Center is in the food science department, right. and, it, yeah. and it's it's done very well. Good. Let me ask a quick question. How, when they chose the name Whistler Center, had, was that any funding that they decided, or they just put that name in when you came? Because sometimes centers are started with 
some funding or they want to name it for somebody. I, was, I thought a researcher might wonder about that. The name, they used his name to attract okay. money because okay. Okay. he was so well known in the sure. industry. Okay. And, that, and that's logical. Yeah. I and mean, that's been done before. Yeah. Well, to honor him, too. Oh, I right. Mean, it was, exactly. Yeah, it was yeah. also yeah. honor him, too. Do yeah. um, you want to make any, uh, you've really covered some comments on your research. Did you want to make any other comment on that? Um, no, I, okay. I, 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 okay. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, uh, out of that whole bunch, I'm a, the polysaccharide chemist who right. does modification okay. <laughs> of polysaccharides and yeah. a lot of these things. And, and in the last 15 years or so, I've focused on starch at, because uh, these companies that support us form an industrial advisory board, um, they call them sustaining member companies, and they all beginning about, um, uh, let's see, we started, the uh, center was formed in 1986, and then about, I was working on non-starch polysaccharides, and about 90 or so, they, they asked that we do starch, because starch is the 800-pound gorilla in the, in the in this business, and so I started doing that, and continued on. I'm so fascinated by it, yeah. I'm still doing it. In the advisory committee, was there any changeover, or did you, how did that? Yes, okay. well, they, we are a changeover. The, the, um, the, well, let me give you one example. Okay. <laughs> we started on early on. I had member companies, you give them money with, I had uh, uh, General Foods and Nabisco and Kraft. And then General Foods bought Nabisco, and then Kraft bought General Foods, and so we I mean, went from three to one. I can't keep one. track of all the things yeah. I've grown up with. Uh, but there was, uh, they, they've come and gone over the years sure. um, uh, for various reasons, mostly budgetary reasons in, within the company. Or sales within, or sales yeah. ownership. But uh, when uh, our original mission, as we, we did it, was, that it still is, to increase the utilization of carbohydrates through basic research in their, in their chemical, physical, and biological properties. Um, and of course, education is a big sure. aspect. And we do not only education of mostly graduate students, but do some undergraduate education, but quite a bit uh, industrial people. We, we okay. present short courses and things like that uh, for the industry. But anyway, we, um, and it was what we call structure function relationships and understanding how the the structures of these materials influence their their say the functionalities right. which ends up in their in their end uses and my job as a chemist is to modify those structures so that change the functionality change the uses but um, when Bruce Amaker came in he added a uh, the health benefits of, of carbohydrates, uh, the poly, particularly starch and, and, and dietary fiber to that. And we have a lot of interest in that now. A lot of companies and new companies have come in because of, they're interested in the health aspects sure, of, sure. of the carbohydrates. Um, we have some ones that are not related to food at all, like Dow AgroSciences and so forth is interested in our because I said we have a corn geneticist who worked with them in terms of modifying right. properties of the starches and so forth. They're interested in that. So, yeah, th there has been a, a, a continual change over the years. We've been Reflecting in existence. Reflecting the needs of the, uh, their consumers and the people that right. were sporting them, right? Okay. The constants of, the only real constants have been the, the, the starch producing companies like it was uh, a. E. Staley Manufacturing Company was now Tate and Lyle, North yeah. America, and those kind of companies, uh, Cargill and, and uh, Grain Processing and National Starch and Chemical and those kind of things. Yeah. They've, they've stayed with it. They've been good Very interest. Good. You need that <laughs> sustainability. Yeah. Did I make, you got a couple of patents. Didn't I've you? got a couple of patents. They were, for nice. various reasons, I say the, I think three of them, and the, the one that was really excited about it, the, well, the 
first two are older and you they were the never put into practice. Is, yeah. But I had a and recent the, one and a company has actually been formed to, to, to This do is the one you got patent. in 98, the last But one? Yeah. in, I have to tell you, we're doing this in, in 2011. The economy's been such in the, in the last uh, couple of years that the, the company has just not been able to raise the capital to build the plant to mm -hmm. make the material, which is xylitol. We had yeah. xylitol is a sweetener that right. not only that uh, uh, non-caloric uh, sweetener type of thing, but it's a, uh, it prevents, it not only doesn't cause tooth decay, it actually prevents tooth decay. And so it's, it's a lot of benefits, and it's made actually from a, from a sugar called xylose, which they get from birch trees and other kind mm -hmm. of things, and it's very, very expensive to produce. And we uh, developed a low-cost way to make it from starch, a very cheap material. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful process. And I say the company is, is there, but they still Trying Still to get the on. capital to make the build keep, the factory. Keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, family, do you have uh, you, uh, wife and children? Do you want to, have any of them come to Purdue or? Yeah. Well, one of the one of the good things about staying at, at Purdue was I, I met my wife here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and and I and I and I also became lifelong friend and colleague with Professor Whistler. So. Sure. Um, but yes, we have we have two children, two sons. Um, what do, do they come to Purdue? Or? No, okay. the, well, we were living in living in, in Illinois when the they were going to, okay. to college, and I have uh, the our oldest son went to University of Illinois in electrical engineering. Our youngest son went to Indiana University, and which people tease me about that as a Purdue alum. And I say to them, not only did I send him to Indiana University, I had to pay out of state tuition for him to go there. I was living in Illinois. <laughs> that stops them, right? <laughs> yeah, stopped them. There you go. They couldn't understand that. Yeah. Now you've been pretty you're active in the alumni, you're or the Purdue alumni, and you're president of the class of '54. Are you still the president of the class? Your class? That was. Yes, and it was it was interesting because I was I was president of the graduating class in '54, yeah. and that year, uh, Joe Rudolph, who was head of the alumni association, decided the first time he was going to put um, a young person on the board. He was going to put, have the, the the president of the graduating class on, on the, the board, board of oh, okay. the alumni board uh, for. I can't remember what it was, five years or something like that. So I was, I was, uh, well, did good. that, and it was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, when I um, said was at Southern Illinois University, and they have a, they had a college of, of agriculture there too, and engineering, and there were a lot of Purdue alumni around there, particularly in agriculture, <laughs> some in, in, in engineering, but. It would come there in, in say, a growing, dynamic university, an exciting place. Uh -huh. And um, so I actually formed an alumni association there, and um, and we we went for, a, yeah, I don't know, it's still surviving, but, but uh, it's okay. we did that, yeah. <laughs> we had fun getting together with... Uh, it is. You know, we were lots of people of the closely... In age, you know, same right. age, and, uh, and uh, a lot of camaraderie. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah, we, right. had, we had a good time. Um, so yeah, I was enjoyed doing that with the alumni association. A couple of your awards. One of the couple of most recently outstanding graduate educator educator award from AG, and then you also got the certificate of distinction from the AG alumni association. Very nice. Got some nice ones. Yeah, Very I nice. Well, I like the 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 educator award particularly. Yeah. I like it. And you know, when I was at uh, at SIU, um, I got had several yes. teaching awards I there, know. which I and, and, you know, I like those among right. amongst others. It was it was great. Uh, uh, I think um, you know, at the at the heart of it, that's what the university is all about: right. is education. So right. those are 
particularly nice things to be recognized for. For the teaching, and others have shared the same thing. They're very pleased to get those awards, and yeah. it means a lot. You know? it, it, it does mean a lot. It I does. Mean, that's, uh, I agree. I mean, that is, sometimes I have to, well, I did when I was director, I had to remind our member companies that the basic reason we were here was for education and not for to do their research for them. I understand. <laughs> oh, American Chemical Society has served in quite a uh, professional yeah. and been pretty active in limited. I Are was you still active keeping that in several professional ways, right. particularly American Chemical Society, because um, you know I it was not for my own advancement. I I, I thought it was right. it was a profession that had been very good to me, and I. I think I owe something to give back to the profession. Right, and it's been established for a long time and has made many contributions to the field. Oh, yeah. And it was yeah. nice that the current president, what, about a year ago, was the Purdue person. Yes, you know, that's which was exactly really right. kind of nice. Oh, well, yeah, I've known personally several of the presidents. Sure. Yeah, it was really, um, yeah, I, I, I think it was, yeah, I've always thought I, I should yeah. owe it to give back to the, to right. the profession that uh, was and so good to me. Let me ask the American Chemical Society Council. Could you make a com what I, that was one I wasn't familiar with? It's a it's it's a legislative body oh, okay. essentially. Okay. Okay. It's uh, is it a separate from? The no, oh. it's uh, it's part of the American the American Chemical Society, and there are American Chemical Society. There are there are local sections like Purdue has a local section. Okay, they're right. all, you know, I don't know how many hundreds are there around sections. They all have a, a counselor that goes there. And then there are the the divisions of, of chemistry like analytical right. chemistry, organic chemistry and so forth. Sure. They all have counselors on there. So there's there's these division things and so they come together and, and it's uh, yeah, it's the legislative body, right, I guess I what you okay. call it. But right. the, and you're a fellow in their Institute of Food Technologists. That's very yes. nice. Very good. Very fellow good. Uh, the fellow of the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, which, right. is a, which is quite an honor. It and certainly is. Yeah. I'll go for that. Uh, what the um, Boy Scouts of America? You've been involved with that, and you chaired some committees. I was I was very involved in that when with uh, when my two sons were growing up, and when we lived in Southern Illinois. Sure. Since coming to this area, I've not been involved. Well, the children have grown. <laughs> I've, the children are grown, but more important than that, I was just too busy sure. uh, starting this the center, right. which was um, which is I mean it's it's. I have to say about the center now, and one of the things it's a Good. it's a brand name. It's it's known throughout the world. That's wonderful. It, they, ever in any place I go in the world, people know the Whistler Center, and so that's very know, nice. Could you make a, uh, for a the researchers a couple comments on Dr. Whistler? I know you addressed him earlier, but he did he really get a start here, or did he come from somewhere before he came to Purdue? Yes, he. Okay. he um, well, his his history was this: he graduated from Heidelberg College in. In, in Ohio, Ohio. Okay. Tiffin, Ohio, mm -hmm. and he went to Ohio State for graduate school, master's. I think it was about, my memory tells me in about 1934, but okay. it was in the Depression. Sure, okay. And at the time he finished his, his master's degree, they were, say it was in the Depression, and right. the department had told him he, that, you know, he couldn't give him an assistantship anymore. And uh, there was a famous carbohydrate chemist there that he got his uh, degree under, Professor Wolfram. And Professor Wolfram had gone to a American Chemical Society meeting and talked to somebody from Iowa State who had um, said that he had a position open that he could get him. So he went to Iowa State and got his PhD. And then from there he went to the um, what it was called then. It was a different thing. But he went to Washington, D.C., and uh, he was uh, was essentially a postdoc uh, in the National Bureau of Standards. Okay. That's what it was. He was in the National Bureau of Standards um, and was there a couple of years. And then in 19, the early 40, 1942, 43, they were establishing the, the four or I guess regional 
laboratories of the USDA for agricultural utilization, mm -hmm. which was right. what she was interested in too. One in Philadelphia, one in in New Orleans, one in Peoria, and one in um, Berkeley, California, I think. Um, somewhere near Berkeley. Uh, and he was offered the position to start the uh, start research at the Peoria lab. So he went to the Peoria lab from, I don't know, somewhere around 42, 43 until about, until the war in 45. I think he came to Purdue in 46. And he had started the Starks Research Program sure. there and then came to Purdue in 46, I think. Very good, that's nice. Um, community service, you got a couple things. Um, the, perhaps I'd like to ask you, the Royal L. Whistler Foundation Board, you served on that for researchers? Yeah, I've, um, essentially, since the beginning, off and sure. on, but I, right. but. Um, Is that headquarters, he was a, headquarters here? It's here. Okay. Professor Whistler was a great outdoorsman, loved outdoors. And when it was still fashionable to do so, he'd go to Africa on safaris, and he liked to go and and big game hunts and big game Sounds game Sounds like Teddy Roosevelt a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and he went all over the world observing birds and things like that. Sure. Loved the outdoors and wildlife. Yeah. And he established a foundation for the uh, protection and preservation of wildlife and wildlife habitat particularly in this part of Indiana. Oh, okay. And we've been able to uh, work with other organizations to secure lots of land, particularly along the Wabash River corridor and so forth, to, uh, to for, for that very purpose, and set it aside for... For the wildlife. For wildlife. Right. right. And really that's nice. what the foundation does. Very nice. That's very good. Um, the NICHES Long Range Planning Commission, yeah. you're on that. Well, we, we work with NICHES. NICHES is, uh, now that's the official name. It used to be called Northern Indiana something. But anyway, it does the same thing. It has, okay. the, has the same goals as the Whistler Foundation. The difference is that they've got, they've got uh, lots of manpower and not much money, and Whistler Foundation's got money and no manpower. <laughs> so we okay. work together with them, and and I say in 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 um, in, in identifying and, and uh, purchasing properties, and, and uh, do you know we do with the niches, the minimal sorts of things on the properties, uh, maybe some some trails or something like sure. that so people can walk through, but they really don't want it. It's not a, it's not a park type of thing, but it really is for the wildlife habitat. Right. So it's, it, it's undisturbed as possible. Okay. But um, there Work are some things, that, yeah. usually a little parking lot or something like sure. that for a few cars that they can go, yeah. Okay. Uh, you got a Purdue tradition? Purdue tradition. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I thought about that and I don't, my, I guess my favorite Purdue tradition is no more. <laughs> my favorite tradition was the Purdue chords, the senior chords. <laughs> Others have mentioned the same thing, and I, I remember yeah. when I first came here that they, well, a couple times they tried to bring it back, but, and I've talked to some people who still have their chords. I don't, yeah, I <laughs> sure couldn't get in my, I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know when that stopped, but no, uh, sometime, in sometime in after I left in 61. Yeah. In fact, um, we got one of the skirts one time donated to the archives, and they said, Katie, why don't you try this on? I said, no, I don't. I don't. Well, when, when you said some people still have them, yeah. when, when uh, we had the 50th reunion in the class of 54, that'd be 2004, that's the sure. last big reunion to get sure. together, and it came, there were several brought, brought their cords. They yeah. didn't wear them, but they brought them. That's okay, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Do you have an outstanding but, event or any I, outstanding event that you'd like to share with us? Um, no. Okay. I, How about really uh, retirement activities? Well, retirement activities are pretty much the same thing I always did. Okay. I'm just getting slower at doing them. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, you know, I still have a research lab in my office. I still, uh, 
I don't get to teach regular university courses anymore. I sure. do still do a fair amount of teaching in, uh, in um, short courses and things like that. And do you do any traveling industry. in conjunction with any of your courses at all that you used to do? or um, I have. Okay. Um, I'm not too long ago, I, I went to Taiwan for two weeks and taught, taught there. And uh, yeah, so, nice. so I've got, yeah, I get, get a few of those. And sometimes I go to, to go to companies for two or three days and or something like that. Yeah. Teach, yeah. It's kind of getting kind of exhausting at my age, so <laughs> not that much anymore. I got some people coming here tomorrow. I'm going to teach. Oh, okay, yeah. carbohydrate chemistry in your own words in the 21st century. Any or anything I forgot to ask? I'm well, closing and, to you and, and my colleague. You know, I I think it's alive and well. And, and going to be continued. In the, there are two kinds of uh, carbohydrates. There was lots of different kinds of carbohydrates, but I'll, uh, chemistry, and I'll limit it to two kinds. Okay. There is a kind, there are, is a, uh, quite a good number of uh, pharmaceuticals, drugs that are made from carbohydrates. And they started in the starting material, lots of chemistry involved, but they make sure. that. And there's still a lot of interest in, in, in those kind of things and people doing that. That's not the kind of carbohydrate chemistry we do. We, we do utilization of the, right. particularly the polysaccharides. That is now um, um, come back in vogue. I said that the, because of the Green Revolution, it went out, but now renewables and uh, all carbohydrates are biodegradable and uh, and it's a sustainable, renewable sorts of things that uh, so uh, making things from, from carbohydrates or uh, particularly polysaccharides is something that's beginning more and more interest. Uh, um, I know um, a company, and I, well, I guess I can name the company as one of the 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 largest I guess uh, consumer product companies in the world, the Procter and Gamble, as a as a program to make as much stuff. They want to make everything they can from their bottles they put their detergents in to everything else from from biodegraded from renewable resources like like the polysaccharides. So there is very, there's very a, encouraging. There's a there's a, a large interest in this. Um, one of the problems is that they want to make they they need the polysaccharides to do things that they not intended to do. <laughs> they can uh, you know the carbohydrates for the most part are water soluble or sure. water swellable or so forth, and so you you need something that's not. But anyway. That's that's the challenges that we face with them. We work with them to do those kind of things. Yeah. Um, so they're they're actually a long long supporters of the Whistler Center. Yeah. That's good. Very good. Anything I forgot to ask, or I think we uh, up to you. Oh boy. I think we're set. I think. I, think, um, I can't think of anything okay. else. I, I, Dr. Miller, I want to thank you very yeah. much. I really do. This has been wonderful. I really yeah. thank you.